Hello everyone, good evening and uh, good morning, good afternoon, kind of depending on where you are in the world. So it's good to be here with you all tonight. And tonight we're gonna to talk about codependency. So I saw in the Facebook group that somebody had posted something about codependency and then there were many comments, there were like 80 some comments after that. So that's clearly a really hot topic for a lot of you. And I think it's a hot topic for a lot of trade partners. It's a bit of a lightning rod kind of issue. And so what I wanted to do was talk to you about codependency, how it became this kind of lightning rod issue, and then what do we want to take from the codependency model and what do we want to leave behind? So kind of thinking about that, because I don't think we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we do need to think about it differently than we have historically. So let's dive into that topic. So back in, I think 1986, Patrick Carnes published Out of the Shadows, which was the first book ever written about sex addiction. So what he did is he took the model that the substance abuse community that was dealing with alcoholism and drug addiction had used in terms of looking at the compulsive use of alcohol and drugs and applied it to sexual behavior that was compulsive. So when he did that, he also brought over from the substance community the issue of codependence because what they had done in their research, they had started to see that alcoholism and drug use, drug abuse affects the entire family. And there were certain patterns that they saw repetitively show up in families that had alcoholism or drug, drug abuse as a central part of things. And so they started to talk about these patterns and name them as codependency in the family members. So Patrick Carnes sort of brought that model over and applied it to betrayed partners from the get-go, from the beginning of really starting to understand sex addiction. And then I think that model has trickled out and also impacted those who are dealing with affairs and not just dealing with addiction. So the problem with this is that while there were indeed patterns that were being seen in these families, we're gonna talk about that more in a minute, it also became a very biased way of viewing the betrayed partner. So the bias was that the betrayed partner's behaviors and their reactions to the, the betrayal, the sexual betrayal, was seen as sickness. So they were, their behaviors and reactions were seen as sick and as unhealthy. And that bias sort of coded how partners were viewed by treatment professionals who often saw their behaviors as sick and unhealthy and labeled them as such. And it wasn't until Barbara Steffens did her research and wrote her book, Your Sexually Addicted Spouse in about 2010, where she introduced the trauma model and really helped the field to shift out of the codependency model and start to understand that no, the behaviors that partners are displaying are actually responses to trauma. They're actually a reaction to the trauma of being betrayed. And I would go a step further than Barbara Steffens did and say, and they're also about an attachment system that is in high, high distress. So when that got introduced to the field, the field made a shift and the field started to recognize the way that we are thinking about betrayed partners is biased and it is not good. And it, it uh, sort of, is pejorative against the partner when they're actually behaving in very normal ways that people respond to relational trauma. These are normal ways that people respond to relational traumas and betrayal in their relationship. So there was a pretty significant course correction that happened there that I think was really needed. And I think most of the field has gotten on board with that course correction and knows that that's kind of uh, how we're thinking about betrayed partners now and how we're looking at them. So, but because it has the history, that history behind it and that bias inside of it, the issue and the language around codependency can still be very, very charged for a lot of people. So what I saw in people's responses in the Facebook group was language that I hear partners come into my office with all the time as well. And what they come in with is a lot of high, high energy and a very charged um, anger. And they come in and they're saying, it is not my fault. This has nothing to do with me. 
I did not cause this problem. I am not part of this problem. I'm not responsible for this problem in any way. This has only to do with my cheating spouse. They are the only ones that are responsible for this. It is all their fault. I refuse to take on an iota of responsibility for anything that has happened here because it is not about me and it is not my fault. So there is this high sort of reactive um, declaration about it is not my fault that partners have. And here's the thing about that. Like I 100% agree with the words of it, right? It isn't your fault. So it is not your fault that your spouse cheated on you. It is not your fault that they are addicted. It is not your fault that they lied to you and manipulated you. Like this, these are choices that they made. These are choices that they made in their addiction or choices they made. And even if there are issues and problems in your relationship, which most relationships have issues and problems and most relationships, both people are contributing to those issues and problems. So even when that's the case, it was still your significant other's decision to handle whatever was happening for them in their life by cheating, by going outside of the relationship. So in that sense, it is absolutely their responsibility to deal with and take care of, and it does not have to do with you, right? It is their choice that they did that or their uh, illness that they're dealing with in terms of the addiction. So I absolutely agree with that. However, the thing I want us to look at is not the words and not the truth that it isn't your fault, but the energy that betrayed partners bring to that. Because the energy behind it often has this um, sort of desperate, declarative, angry edge behind it, right? They're trying to offload something. And I believe that that has to do with what I call repudiating shame. So I think that partners bring this sort of, no, it is not my fault, no, it is not my fault, it's all his fault, energy, because they're trying to repudiate the shame of sexual betrayal. So let's talk for a minute about the shame that comes with sexual betrayal. So there's really two kinds of shame that attach to you when you are dealing with sexual betrayal as the betrayed partner. So one is cultural shame. So in our culture, and I'm gonna to talk to those of you who are female betrayed partners for a minute because it's particularly true for female betrayed partners. So in our culture, if your man cheats on you, who is to blame? The woman is to blame, right? She couldn't keep her man, she couldn't keep him there, something's wrong with her, he cheated on her for a reason, she must be frigid, she must be cold, she must be blah, 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 right? There is this belief that it's the woman's fault if the man cheats. Now, whose fault is it if the woman cheats on the man? Culturally, it's still the woman's fault. Now she's a slut, right? She's a slut that couldn't stay where she belonged. So culturally, we have this profound, very embedded belief that when sexual betrayal occurs, it is the female's fault. They are responsible for that in some way. And even though we don't agree with that in our heads, like I certainly don't agree with that, I think it's the most toxic cultural belief we have, one of the terrible beliefs, so even as betrayed partners, though we may not believe that in our minds and we may refute it in our minds, we're still swimming in the culture and we're still bathing in that. And those beliefs become very deeply embedded inside of us, unconsciously in us, even though we don't agree with them consciously. So for most betrayed partners, they are dealing with a layer of cultural shame that attaches to them, particularly if you're a female betrayed partner. For male betrayed partners, the cultural shame is a little bit different. The cultural shame for male betrayed partners has to do with you couldn't keep your woman under control. It's sort of this like you're a cuckold, you're a fool, you were embarrassed, you were humiliated, you were made a fool of as a man. So it kind of attacks your manhood and says, you know, you couldn't keep your woman under control the way you were supposed to. So men also have a cultural shaming dynamic that attaches to them as well as betrayed partners. So both, both genders get it, both sexes get it, males get it, women, women get it, men get it. 
but in different ways and different messages that are coming. So what that gives us though, is this deep sense of shame that attaches itself to us, cultural shame that we carry about the betrayal and believe, even though we know it's not our fault, believe inside of us that it is. So that's the first type of shame. The second type of shame is personal shame. So this is the shame that comes from the fact that when your significant other cheats on you, they are by definition choosing somebody other than you to be sexual with. Whether that is pornography or whether that is a person, they are going outside of your relationship and being sexual with someone else. And automatically that creates self-doubt. It creates a sense of, am I not enough? Am I too much? Am I desirable? Am I attractive? Am I lovable? Am I worthy? It brings up all these questions that are very, very personal about whether we are worthy of fidelity and honesty and loyalty from our partner, whether they are still um, engaged with us and want us and want to be in relationship with us. And those self-doubts often trigger deep shame inside of us as we wonder if we are in some way at fault for the fact that our significant other chose somebody else. So those two types of shame are really difficult for betrayed partners to deal with. And over and over and over again, I have partners say to me, I know in my head that it is not my fault. My body doesn't know, my heart doesn't know. Like it hasn't all caught up yet. So I don't really know deep within me that it's not my fault. I know it in my head, but that's all. So I think that when betrayed partners are, you know, sort of really energized around, I'm not codependent, don't you call me that, it's not my fault, it didn't have anything to do with me, he or she is the one who did this, he or she is the one who cheated, they're the ones that are the bad guy, they are the jerk, they're the bad guy. I think that often what betrayed partners are doing is they're trying to get the shame off from them. They're trying to repudiate the cultural shame and the personal shame that betrayal so easily brings and sort of coats you with. So I think that this energy that's brought to this is often energy of trying to get the shame off from you in some way, get the shame repudiated away from you. So I want everyone to just kind of think about that because I think that when we get stuck in a stance where we are trying to repudiate shame and that's how we're dealing with the shame and there are better ways to deal with the shame than that, that energy of trying to get it off from us and repudiate it and it's not my fault, it's their fault, etc., can actually block your pathway to healing. It can actually keep you stuck in um, not going and getting help and get you, keep you stuck in behaviors that you're repeating and patterns that you're repeating. Um, so it, that energy can actually stall you in your ability to actually move through the betrayal and heal from it. I think one of the biggest reasons partners don't go get treatment for those who have not gone and gotten treatment or don't go is this shame issue. I think they're so worried that they're going to go to therapy and somehow the therapist is going to say something that affirms for them in some way that it is their fault, that they don't even want to go to therapy. They, they, they don't even want to go hear it. And here's the thing. I do know, I've seen the posts in the Facebook group about some of the experiences that people are having in therapy and that occasionally there are therapists who are still working out of that old biased framework. There are some folks doing that. And so I do know that sometimes things are said that absolutely hit that button. I also know that sometimes therapists say something and that is not what they mean, but the sensitivity for partners is so high that they might be being blamed that they hear it as blaming. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you if in any way your therapist says something to you that, that hits that button for you, go back and talk to your therapist about it. Because most of the time that is not gonna be what they were trying to communicate to you. And it's just that whatever they said, hit that very, very sensitive button where you've got the shame, the cultural shame and the personal shame that are making you very sensitive to anything where the partner might, where the therapist might be trying to blame you. And in addition to that, 
you've also got an addicted partner or a cheating partner who often has been blaming you already. So you've already been trying to get yourself out from under their blaming and along with the cultural and personal shame that you're already dealing with. So you're already dealing with a lot of that. So it can make you extremely sensitive to anybody or any comment that makes you feel like maybe your deepest fear inside of you that you are somehow at fault is true. Because that's why partners are so reactive. It's that, that, oh my goodness, my worst fear is actually maybe true. When somebody says something blaming, that's what's getting hit. So what you want to do is really think about how to, you know, continue getting the help you need, continue down the path you need to walk um, in terms of your own healing and balancing and holding intention that it is not your fault and that you actually still do need help. So let's talk for a minute about in what way is codependency actually valuable and actually helpful for us as partners? And if that word is really activating for you, ditch the word. So don't call it codependency, don't think about it in that way. But what I want you to do is I want us to just think about what was codependency originally actually trying to help us look at and where might it be valuable for us to continue to look at it as betrayed partners. So everybody that is in a relationship, relationships form systems. So a system is, you know, action and response, action and response, response, action. It's this feedback loop between one or two or more parts that form a system. So when we're talking about relationships, a relationship is the thing that the two of you create between you. It's the thing that is created by this action and response, action and response dynamic between the two of you. So what that means is that when you are living in a system, you are both shaping constantly what the relationship looks like and what is happening in the relationship. So if you were in, let's say you're in a marriage, an 18 year mar marriage, and you find out that your spouse is an addict and he's been acting out the whole marriage, you find out. So now what you thought was that everything looked one way and it was going along one way and you were operating one way in the relationship. And then you find out there was a secret life, a double life, lying and sexual betrayal the entire time. It's very easy to think, well, I didn't know about it. So therefore, it didn't impact me or shape me in any way because I didn't have any idea that it was happening. But the reality is that systems are working both consciously and unconsciously. We're both, we're shaping everything both consciously and unconsciously in our relationship. And when you are in a relationship with an addict, even when you don't know you're in a relationship with an addict, you are responding and being shaped by and create and uh, creating behavioral patterns in response to the addiction, even though you don't know it. So an example of this would be, for example, let's say in your relationship, one of your patterns has been spending those 18 years working so hard to try to get your partner to be engaged with you, that you've always felt like that, that uh, he or she's slightly disengaged not there, not present in the way you really want them to. And so you've got all these different ways that you try to get them engaged with you. And you try to bring them over and get them invested emotionally in the way that you want them to be invested. Those are behavior patterns that are shaping you and how you do a relationship with them. You could be pursuing a lot. You could be appeasing a lot. You could be putting their needs before your needs. You could be caretaking a lot. You could be uh, creating a lot of conflict. You can do this in all kinds of different ways. So even though you don't know that there's an addiction, the addictive dynamic is still there and it's still shaping how the two of you interact with one another and how you cope with stresses in the relationship and what you're doing with things. So relationships are systems and those patterns of behavior, often when you're dealing with addiction, often are not super healthy patterns. 
And here's the thing, many of us bring these patterns with us into our marriage, right? We bring them from our family of origin where maybe we didn't have good modeling or we lived in families where there's neglect or abuse or less than nurturing environments. And we had to learn to cope with that. And then we come to our marriage, we just bring those coping skills with us and those coping patterns with us. And then we form a system and create a system together within that. So the important thing for partners is for them to be able to look at what happened for me in this system. How did I start to behave even though I didn't know about this? What did I bring in from my family of origin? What has served me really well and been really healthy and good for me? And what is actually an unhealthy pattern that I need to change and look at? That I think is the piece of work for partners in terms of looking at what's been happening for them in the relationship and how they've been dealing with things. So it is, and it is important for them to look at this in order to heal. You've gotta be able to really understand your own story and what shaped you and what brought you to where you're at in order to really heal and move forward. So I'll give you like, this is the best story of like kind of, I think how partners who are repudi stuck in repudiating shame can block their pathway to healing. So like this happened several years ago and it just stumped our intake coordinator at the center. So she got a call from a man and he said, hey, I wanna come in for couples counseling. So she's like, great, she's talking him through like, uh, therapists and scheduling and stuff. And she said, okay, so what's your wife's name? And he was like, no, no, she's not coming with me. And so, uh, Teresa, our intake coordinator, she said, oh, okay. So you want to do individual therapy, not couples therapy. And he was like, no, no, I'm coming for couples therapy. So there's like silence, right? She's like, hmm. She says, okay, but your wife, then your wife is coming with you. And he said, no, no, my wife is not coming with me. He said, uh, my wife has made it very clear that I'm the one that cheated and I'm the one that has this problem, this addiction, and I'm the one that broke everything. So I've got to go fix it. And she wants me to come do couples therapy on my own and fix our relationship. So we can all look at that and say, well, that's not going to work. You have to both be there to fix the coupleship. However, I think this partner, and I think in her right mind, not in the throes of betrayal trauma and trying to deal with the shame, probably could have seen that and thought, yeah, that's probably not right. But I think in the throes of that, that partner thought, you go fix it. You're the, you're the one that caused this problem. I'm not going near anything that will make me feel blamed for this. So that's just an example of how you can get stuck and kind of block your own healing in terms of really looking at your own story and your own patterns and what you bring into the relationship. So let's think just for a minute about the definition of codependency. So I am trained by Pia Melody. I was trained by her, her years ago. Pia is one of the um, uh, people who really developed codependency and understanding patterns of it. And her definition of it is that it is a response to developmental trauma. So if you think about that, codependency is a response to trauma. It's just the patterns of behavior that we actually develop when we are dealing with relational trauma and we're trying to manage relational trauma. So I like that definition because that is a non-biased definition. It is a non-pejorative definition and it does not label all of the behaviors as sickness. It labels them as normal responses to developmental trauma. So Ann Smith of at Care and Treatment also has a great definition of that that I like. And her definition is that codependency is a normal response to an abnormal stressor. So it is the normal ways we respond when abnormal stressors or traumas are introduced into things. So the normal patterns that we can get into. So again, I like these definitions because they're non-pejorative, they're non-biased, they're non-blaming, they understand human response to trauma. So the way I also think of codependency, the additional definition that I kind of layer on is that I think codependency is a lot about de-selfing. So when I say de-selfing, what I mean is that it's about a difficulty maintaining a sense of self in relationship with another person. It's where you lose yourself 
over and over when you're relating to another person. And that can look many, many, many different ways. But often for a betrayed partner, the pathway to healing is about recovering a sense of self. It's about figuring out what you need. It's about learning to use your voice effectively. It's about learning to set boundaries, learning to value your needs equally with that of your partner. So, so much of the healing for a betrayed partner is about how they have lost their sense of self in this dynamic and system where cheating has been happening and lying has been happening. So in that sense, I think codependency and looking at those patterns has something to offer us. And I think it's really important to look at, yes, how did this shape me? And how did maybe I even bring stuff in from my family of origin? And how have I lost my ability to both have a strong sense of self and feel very connected to my significant other? I don't know how to do those two things. Those two things are really in tension for me. I didn't learn how, or I lost it when I came into this relationship and other patterns took over. So these are, I think, the things that we don't want to lose by saying, you know, kind of having a critique of codependency and where it has historically been and the way that it has been biased against partner, which is a legitimate and good critique. And we needed that course correction as a field. But I think we don't want to throw away the fact that, oh, we do as betrayed partners need to understand what has happened for us in this relationship, what happened for us in our family of origin, and what are the patterns and behaviors that we've gotten into that are not serving us well. And they're actually keeping us stuck and they're keeping us from having a really strong sense of self that we operate out of in all of our life. So that is how I think about these issues. And I wanted to share that with you and in the hopes that it will take the charge out of it some for you and that you'll be able to start to really recognize, oh, this energy that I get around this is about my fear. It's about my shame and my fear that other people are gonna blame me. That if people in my friends, people in my family and friends knew they would think it was my fault, that the therapist is gonna think it's my fault, that my spouse is blaming me for their cheating, it's about my fear about that and also my internal self-doubt and that question that niggles at your heart about, is it really my fault? So I think understanding that that's the energy that's often coming up around this can be really, really helpful. So I hope you it helps you with it and I hope that it will let you sort of hold in tension these two things, that it is not your fault, it is absolutely not your fault and you're not responsible for your partner's cheating and acting out and you still have to look at your own story and your own patterns and behaviors because you have been in this dynamic and in this system and it has shaped you in ways that you have to look at in order to really be healthy and have a strong sense of self. All right, so that's my thoughts on codependency and shame and repudiating shame and I will see you all next week, bye. Mm -hmm.